Are you ready for the Savior? He is coming by and by. Are you ready for the meeting in the air? He is coming with the angels from his Father's home on high. Will you be ready then to meet him there? Ever be ready then to meet him when he comes? Ever be ready for the meeting in the air? Have your lamps then burning bright, trimmed at morning, noon, or night? Ever be ready then to meet him there? Are you ready for the Savior should he suddenly appear? Has his blood washed from your heart all sinful stain? As the prophecies and seasons tell his advent's very near, will you be ready when he comes again? Ever be ready then to meet him when he comes? Ever be ready for the meeting in the air? Have your lamps been burning bright, trimmed at morning, noon, or night? Ever be ready then to meet him there? Are you ready for the Savior should he come to take his own? Would you be among the saved at his right hand? When the judgment fires are burning and the mighty trump has blown, will you be ready with the saints to stand? Ever be ready then to meet him when he comes. Ever be ready for the meeting in the air. Have your lamps been burning bright, trimmed at morning, noon, or night. Ever be ready then to meet him there. Welcome, brothers and sisters, and good morning. Welcome to God's house and to uh, our opportunity to come together as a family of one heart and one mind and one purpose, to lift up our voices and lives to our Heavenly Father. scripture uh, setting and a call to worship for our gathering this morning, I would read to you from Latter-day Revelation. From just last year, in the 169th section of the Doctrine and Covenants. In the past, you have been asked to read, study, and obey. Continue to be more diligent in this commandment. It will be of great benefit to you as the days ahead become more troublesome. I have asked you to read that you might spend more time with me. And by so doing, you will develop that relationship with me, which will strengthen you. Place my words upon your hearts and in your minds. There are many voices pulling your concepts away from my concepts. Satan is working diligently in these last days to distract mankind. You must be able to hear me now in order to continue to hear me in the midst of chaos. For I come in the midst of chaos, and it will be harder to hear me 
unless you have heard me now. Study to know my ways and desires for mankind. The scriptures have been my guidance and counsel to you from the beginning. Internalize them and let them be your guide. The only way to peace is through the ways of God the Father. The kingdom is his and will be governed by his ways and not the ways of man. If you will open your hymnals to number 153, we will stand together and sing this uh, opening hymn. And Brother Ian Wilson will bring our invocation. Oh, bow your heads with me. Lord, I pray to you right now to ask to invite your spirit during this service to bless us all and to protect us all and to guide Brother Jack to say the right words, Lord. And I say this all in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. From the New Testament, the words of our master, he tells us that to, to whom much is given, much is required. 
And the Book of Mormon expounds upon that in a, little, a little bit and says that to whom much is given, much uh, they shall give much or in part of their substance. And to he that has a little shall a little be given, and to him that has none shall be given to them. And so these words uh, these from the scriptures give us words of counsel in our time uh, now at the offertory and gives us uh, a fairness that God get, outlines for us as we give and as we contemplate our giving. Would you bow with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, you have given us the uh, breath of life and you have blessed us with this church and this congregation. And so, Father, as we contemplate our giving, whether it be of financial means or of our talents or of our time or of our, our other abilities, may you uh, guide each one in their thoughts and that the, we, they may give according to that which they have so that the kingdom may be blessed and so that all may be set equal, and that there should be no more poor among us. And so, Father, as only you can do, we would ask that you would multiply this giving today and that it might uh, do that according to what you have planned. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Good morning. So I know everybody in here knows this, but there are no accidents. Um, everything happens for a reason. Uh, and I guarantee when Eddie was putting the lineup together today, he didn't know this. Um, but when I looked at the lineup and I saw that Brother Jack Evans was preaching, I'm like, I have a kinship to Jack, whether Jack really knows it or not, um, or anybody else in this room, but I've worked with his son for the last 22 years. Um, and Aaron's one of my one of my best friends at work. Uh, I've leaned on him for many years. Um, so though I may not know Jack real well, I know Jack real well uh, because I know Aaron real well. And Aaron's got a good soul and is a good person, um, very humble, and has helped me on my walk. And it's even more ironic, if we want to call it that, uh, the topic that I'm going to kind of talk about and how I how I came to have it weave into the fabric of uh, today's uh, scripture reading. Uh, the, the theme, I think you've heard it a couple times already today, but I picked out uh, just one section that I'll, I'll discuss, and then I'm going to talk about an article that I read that you'll think that has absolutely nothing to do with the theme, and I'll hopefully explain it. So uh, Doctrine and Covenants 169, 3B. You've already heard it this morning. You'll hear it again. Uh, I have asked you to read that you might spend more time with me, and by so doing, you will develop that relationship with me, which will strengthen you. Place my words upon your hearts and, your, and in your minds. 
There are many voices pulling your concepts away from my concepts. Satan is working diligently in these last days to distract mankind. You must be able to hear me now in order to continue to hear me in the midst of chaos. For I come in the midst of chaos, and it will be harder to hear me unless you have heard me now. So I looked at that theme earlier this week, and I kind of paid attention. And I, whenever I have an assignment, I, I tend to be a little bit more in, in check with things that I'm doing in my life. Uh, an assignment as far as a preaching assignment or anything that I'm doing up front, I start paying attention to, to the things that I'm reading that may be secular, they may be outside of church readings, and thinking about how they can apply because there's universal truths in life. Um, and I came across a universal truth as I was reading an article by Sid Heal. And you're going to go, what in the world? Uh, Sid is a, is a law enforcement uh, practitioner. He just passed away last month, which is a, a pretty big blow to... Um, to law enforcement as far as critical thinking goes, because Sid has written multiple books on um, one of the topics that I'm going to talk about. Uh, the article that I found is called Biomechanics of Critical Decision Making. And everybody in the room is going, what in the world does that mean? Biomechanics of Critical Decision Making. Well, I had to read the article several times, just so you know, so I had a better understanding of it. And I think it ties in extremely well with our theme because the Lord's telling us we need to walk closer with him and we need to read his word in order to hear his voice, right? Because there's certain things that are hardwired in our brain. And the article by Sid Heal talks about during high-stress situations, and the term chaos that's mentioned in Doctrine and Covenants, I don't think that we quite have a grasp of the level of chaos that will be coming. We think society's in chaos right now. I don't think we have any idea of what it's going to be. Um, and if we haven't practiced and learned how to hear the Lord's voice in times of what we would believe to be relative chaos, when the heat really gets turned up, are we going to be able to turn to him? Are we going to be able to hear the counsel he's giving? Um, so this article talks about when we get presented with high-stress situations, the amygdala, which is about the size of an almond, is the piece of the brain that takes over. And it's the fight-or-flight response that we get. Um, it will hijack other higher functions of the brain for our survival. Now, when it hijacks those higher functions of our brain, it also leaves big gaps. Like, we don't hear things. It's called auditory exclusion. We don't see things. We get tunnel vision because we're focusing on that thing which is the most treacherous to us. That's the amygdala doing its job. Unfortunately, when it hijacks all those higher functions, sometimes it can confuse us. It can make us make the wrong decision because we're not using those high functions of our brain to be able to process through the situation. So the example, there, there's a big long write-up in the article, and it gives an example of an individual walking down a dark, uh, a dark alleyway, paying very close attention to everything that's around them, trying to be safe, trying to be mindful. It's dark. It's a dangerous area. And all of a sudden, they hear footsteps approaching very quickly from behind out of the darkness. Well, the amygdala immediately hijacks all the high functions of the brain. And it causes them to focus all their attention on that dark figure. Within two or three seconds, they realize that dark figure is somebody that's familiar to them, a partner, a friend. But it took several seconds for their brain to calm them down, to recognize the higher order that's there. The amygdala did its job. It made you aware of all those concerning things. However, it took the, the other portions of the brain that could function at a higher order to be able to bring calm to that. How I think this applies to the scripture is if with training, because I've done this a long time and I've learned it, with training, you can, can control those higher functions of your brain. You can cause them to kick in a little bit faster when you've been exposed and you've been stress inoculated, I think is the term that's used. When you spend a lot of time in stressful, high stress events, your brain starts to be able to recognize and perform those higher order functions faster. Not, not as fast as the amygdala, but faster than they were if you're not trained, not conditioned for it. So there's a default setting in our brain when those certain triggers happen, right? And it's to go to the amygdala first, which may not be best for us. Well, there's default settings in how we're made, and that's we're sinners. 
every one of us. And if left to our own devices, my default is sin. That's what it is. I default sin first, selfishness first, me first. And the only way that I can, and I can't fix that, but by nearing my walk with the Lord, now I'm starting to operate at that higher level. I'm starting to activate those higher functions in my brain, and I can process through. When the me first comes through, I can quell that and go, hmm, not today. I'm not going to allow that to take over because I'm reading, because I'm studying, because I'm obeying. And I always know when I'm reading more, my patience level is much greater with the outside world. And when I'm not reading and I'm not doing the things that I should be doing as far as practicing on a daily basis, it's real easy to get frustrated by things that shouldn't frustrate me and give other people the keys to the car of my emotions. So the one thing, and I'll leave you with this, um, I won't read the long explanation of the biomechanics. Hopefully I've made, a, made an example that everybody understands. The one thing I'll talk to my guys about when we're training, how hard would you train today at whatever task it is? Let's say we're doing some hostage rescue stuff, some real high speed, cool stuff, right? And we're training hostage rescue. How hard would you train today? How many hours would you invest? How much effort would you put into it? Would you take an errant shot and go, ah, that was okay. You know, we'll get better next time. If you knew tomorrow the phone was going to ring and you're going to be activated to do a hostage rescue. And every person in that room would go, we'll stay extra. We'll put in as much time as required. We'll do whatever it takes. We don't want to make a mistake. If you knew the Lord was coming tomorrow, how much effort would you put into your study today and your relationship building today? My scripture, reading, my scripture reading this morning comes from Hebrews 11th chapter, verses 1 through 6. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the wor worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which were not to appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he, by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found, because God had translated him. For before his, his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. More than friend or life to me All along my pilgrim journey Savior, let me walk with thee I will be close to thee I will be close to thee All For ease or worldly pleasure, not for fame my prayer shall be. Gladly will I toil and suffer, only let me walk with thee. Let me stay close to thee. Let me stay close to thee. Gladly will I toil and suffer. Only let me walk with thee. Lead 
me through the tribulation. Bear me o'er life's fitful sea. Through the gate of Zion City, may I enter, Lord, with thee, there to be close to thee. Ne'er to be close to thee Through the gate of Zion City May I enter, Lord, with This morning, Willie started off talking about faith. Eric mentioned faith in his class, and we're going to hear something about faith today. It says, uh, study to show God's ways, and we're going to talk about God's ways. And I hope as I share basically my testimony this, this morning, you'll see where God is way out in front of you and preparing the way before you. At least in my life, he certainly has. He's, he's been years ahead of me, preparing things that he knew, knew that was going to happen in the future, to prepare a way that it might occur as he desired it to occur. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the faith of our fathers ahead of us, going all the way back into Genesis here. Genesis, seventh chapter, uh, talks about Enoch. And this is we get seventh, seventh chapter, beginning with 15 to 17. It says, and I have to take my glasses off so I can read. Sorry about that. It says, um, it says, and so great was the faith of Enoch, so great was the faith of Enoch that he led the people of God and their, and their enemies came to battle against them and he spake the word of the Lord and the earth trembled and the mountains fled even according to his command. And the rivers of the waters were turned out of their courses, and the roar of the lions was heard out of the wilderness. And all nations feared greatly, so powerful was the word of Enoch, of Enoch, and so great was the power of the language which God had given him. What great faith Enoch had. And of course we know Enoch built a city, a city of righteousness. And then we go back and look at some things about Abraham's account. I'll uh, turn first to Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verses 8 to 11. It says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should have to receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. That's that faith that the assurance of things hoped for. But he obeyed the words of God. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, and as a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob and the heirs, the heirs with him for the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations whose builder and maker was God. He was looking for that Enoch city, I'm sure. And go out back to Genesis, another account of Abraham, the great faith he had. This is Genesis 22. This is verse 2, and I'll skip down to 8 through 22. And now the Lord said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering upon one of the mountains of which I will tell thee. And it goes down in, in verse 8, it says, And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, saying, My father? And he says, Here am I, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb? Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abram said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both, they went both of them together, and they came to the place which God had told him. 
And Abraham built an altar there, and he laid the woods in order and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hands, and he took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham said, Here am I. And the angel said, Lay not thine hands upon thy lad, neither do thy anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, and seeing that thou hast not only withheld thy son, thine only son Isaac, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes, and he looked and beheld, and behind a thicket there was a ram caught by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram off and offered him up for a burnt offering to the Lord instead of his son. That's the faith that we come from, folks. We're the seed of Abraham. What great faith he had, even though God said he, wanted, he knew that God could raise his son up from the dead if necessary. So this is the faith that we're talking about. In fact, we'll go back here to Paul mentions this in Hebrew 11, beginning with 17 through 20. It says, and if you notice, faith wasn't mentioned in Genesis here, but Paul reiterates these accounts. He, he knows what took place. He has the records. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promise offered up his only son, only begotten son, of whom it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So Abraham knew, but God, God had told him, through Isaac your seed will be known throughout the world. It says, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which also he received him in a, in a figure. So, again, this is the faith of Abraham to first of all leave his home for his father and his mother and then go into a strange land, a land of promise. And then because God felt that he loved it, Isaac when he did him, he said, offer him up a sacrifice to prove your love to God. And so he did because he had the faith to know that even if he had sacrificed his son, God can raise him from the dead. He knew those things. I'm hoping as I continue here, uh, one more, one more, Moses, uh, verse 11, chapter 11 again, 24. You might read the whole chapter 11 when you go home. 24 and 25. By faith, Moses, when he was come to the years of discretion, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer afflictions with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. That was the faith of Moses. We know the story of Moses raised by Pharaoh's daughter. And so, great faith. Well, I want to share this thing about knowing God's ways and what God does is by sharing some testimonies. Uh, my wife and I met at Graceland College, got married, had, had my first son in college, and moved to Independence, Missouri in 1963. We attended Farview Heights for seven years and moved over to Gudgeon Park area. While well, at Gudgeon Park, we had a new pastor came in named Wilbur Ray. Wilbur grew up in, uh, uh, oh, name stood me here, St. Joe. And he uh, was a good man, an elder of the church. But he came to me uh, one day and said he wanted to come visit my, me and my wife. And so he did. Now, at that time, I was a priest in the church. And, uh, my, my mother raised me very good. You know, my dad died when I was six. And I lived in Bruton, Alabama, where reunion grounds were down there, and we walked two miles every, every Sunday. My mom would get up in the morning with me and my two older sisters, and got us ready for church, and we walked across town for two miles to get to church. And generally, we were the first ones there. So mom taught me the importance of going to church. So when I got married and had children, I knew I had to take my kids to church. So as a priest, I didn't volunteer to do much, but if I was asked to do something, I would. I'd offer a prayer. If someone wanted to go and visit, I'd go visit. But I wasn't living a good life. You know, church was at least third in my life. My family came first. We'd go places on weekends, do things together. And my work was important to me, so I'd, I'd go to work. And church was down the line. And when Wilbur Ray came, he said, but now we're going to says, I have evidence I have a call for you to an office of elder. I doubted it. Seriously doubted it. 
I said, I need time to pray. And he said, well, I need to know it pretty quick. So I'm outlining my uh, next year's plan that I got. I need an assistant to be a pastor. The pastor wanted me to be assistant. So I prayed for that for a week or two, and finally I had to give it an answer. And in my prayer, I kept saying to the Lord, Lord, you promised to give us a testimony of the call, and I don't have one. And the thought came to me, well, Jack, if you turn it down and it is of God, you're, you're rejecting God. What will be your faith? And so I said, okay, Lord, I'll take it on faith. Faith. But I said, before I could really function, I need a testimony. So I accepted the call, and Brother Wilbur says, I want Patriarch Frank White was standing Gudge apart. I want him to ordain you. I said, that's fine. Well, Gudgel had 600 members. Elder people met at 8.30 in the morning for preaching. Had stayed for classes. And then the young adults went to, went to the 11 o'clock service. So our paths had never crossed. I'd been going to Gudgel for a couple of years. But I knew who he was, but then we never had any conversations together. But during that ordination prayer, about halfway through, he paused. <laughs> Here on Johnny Thomas said, the man doesn't even know what to pray for. That's me. <laughs> the weakness of the flesh. And the very next word, the brother Frank says, Brother Jack, the Lord has confirmed unto me this very moment the divinity of your call. And the Spirit of God came through his hands and filled my whole being. And I knew I had a testimony of my call, and God promised, as God has promised, he'd do that for us if we'd ask in faith believing. Now, I made a covenant also and told him if I had that testimony, I'd study his word. At that time in my life, I'd never read the Book of Mormon. I'd get to Second Nephi and go to sleep from the prophecies of Isaiah. So that's, I'd read parts of it, but never read it all the way through. And so I picked up my Book of Mormon, my missionary edition, and started reading. I gave up my card game at work on, at noon, took the book to, to, to sit there with a brown bag and re would read out of the scriptures, and you can see I'm an emotional man. And tears would come to my eyes, and I'd have to wipe my face and blow my nose and all that, but I still read the Book of Mormon, and I couldn't put it down. So that's just a brief testimony of, of that. But uh, another thing that God did at that time, here I've been an elder for probably less than two years, and we were, uh, there was a man named George Gross that went to Gudge of Bark. A lot of people probably knew George. Good man. Came out of Maine, but uh, he had a daughter named Jenny. Jenny had been in, under radiation for a couple of years. She had cancer of the lymph nodes in her neck and throat and upper body. And the doctors can't he'd come to him and says, "We can't continue to give your daughter radiation. The radiation will do more harm than the cancer." And so George was beside himself and then asked Wilbur to come together for a special prayer. So Wilbur. Asked me, here I am, a young elder in the church, asked me along with a guy named Henry Schaefer. Those who lived in Independence know the name of Henry Schaefer, a great man from Germany. Everybody loved Henry. He had a great testimony at the Book of Mormon, and everybody loved him. Very spiritual man. And here he's asking me, along with himself and, and Henry and another man, I can't remember his name. It's strange, I can remember where he lived. He lived on 39th Street, just a little east of Phelps Road. We went to his house to have prayer. We gathered there that evening. We had a circle of prayer. We prayed testimonies, and we stayed there until 6 o'clock in the morning praying for Jenny Gross. All night long, we fasted and prayed, and the scriptures tell us to. Next, we got up, we went back home, we got ready to church, went to church, and after church, we made arrangements to go over to George's house and administer to Jenny. And we did that. Jenny lived at least another 40 years. I went to Florida for 22 years and came back in 05, and Jenny passed away around 2010. That's what God has done for me. But why in the world would I be doing, why would I be going there and doing those things? Because God wanted me to. We gathered in, in 1963. I become disgruntled with my work. And in 1983, the Lord moved me to Tallahassee, Florida. Can you believe that? Tallahassee, Florida. Well, I'm an engineer. A couple of years before that, I, I designed the work with a design on a huge bridge in Houston, over the Houston Ship Channel. It was a concrete segmental structure. That means it's built out of concrete and segments. 
and the main span over the channel was 750 foot long. Folks, that's not small. A football field is only 300 feet from goal to goal. It's a big bridge. Well, because the company never designed one, and certainly me, not me, with just a BS degree, no master, no PhDs. They, they put a clause in the contract that the contractor could hire an engineer to redesign the structure if they thought they could save some money. Well, they did. They hired this firm in Tallahassee, Florida. They redesigned it, but guess what? I had to review their design and check their design and criticize them if they made mistakes. And so they were so impressed with that a few years later, they came to me and said, we want you to come to Tallahassee and run our office down here. Well, I never planned on leaving, but I, got, I left Howard Needles where I was working to take a job with a company that made micro microwave communication towers. Those those big dishes you see on those big tall towers. Well, the company that made the dishes wanted to do a, a turnkey process on how to make the towers, erect the towers, put their dishes on and do the one thing. So they bought out the company and they were going to move the fabrication to Arkansas for cheaper labor. We said, where are the engineers going? We don't know. Well, their headquarters was in Chicago. And this guy out of Hazzy Potter says, I want, to, I want you to come down to Florida and see our office and see if you can, we want to offer you a job. You see how God works? God is so far ahead of us is preparing the way before us for various things. We moved to, to Florida in 1983. Well, what happened in 1984 in the church? I'm sure you all all remember that. Well, there were saints down in that part of the country that needed somebody who was familiar with things going on in Independence. And that was me. Not that I was anything great, it's just that I had some experience with what the church was going on. And so, yes, we formed a restoration branch. Well, before that, one of the ladies that went to Tallahassee there at the church, she grew up in Maine also, on Bills Island. She, and she had inherited her, her parents' home, so she and her husband would go, uh, go to Maine for about two to three months every summer. Well, somewhere around 1986, I can't remember, it was 85, 6 or 7, somewhere in that neighborhood, the Maine people had formed a restoration branch and were going to hold a reunion, a restoration reunion. So Gretchen called and said, Jack, you may want to go up and see this reunion they're going to have up here. So I took off to work on Wednesday, got a flight to Boston, rented a car and drove to Maine, found the reunion ground. I'd never been there before in my life, but I was able to find it. We had some wonderful experiences. Some of the ladies who sang in the choir said they, were, they left a, the dining hall to walk across the grassy field where the church was, and they heard singing going on. They said, oh, we must be late. So they rushed over and went into the tabernacle, and everybody in there was just talking and carrying on. They said, were y'all singing? No. They heard the angels singing, folks. Wonderful testimonies. They wore that testimony there. Well, again, old doubting Thomas, what am I going to do? Are these people doing right? What's the Lord trying to say? So the last night there, I walked out into the woods. And in those woods, those pine tops and everything, it cuts out all light, very dark. And I just poured out my heart to God and said, God, are these people doing the right things? I never thought I'd leave the church. Not the church of Jesus Christ. Are they doing the right thing? I need to know. Well, as you know, the last, son, last day of the reunion, they always have a baptismal service. A guy named Dale Smith had a daughter named Jenny. Jenny was autistic, and he had, always had ear infections, so she was never allowed to go in the water. Well, Sherry, she was already a teenager and never been baptized. And they finally convinced her she needs to be baptized, and she wouldn't be baptized. It turned out to be a rather cool morning that morning in Maine. And they walked out there, and Jenny was going to be the first baptized. They must have been about six or eight kids to be baptized that day. Jenny started fretting and fussing and everything, and so Dale pulled her out of line and told her to go ahead and baptize the others. And here I am, I'm waiting for the testimony. Well, I need to back up just a little bit. At that reunion, George Gross's parents were there. Now, George Gross's parents lived in Independence, close to George. But they went back to Maine to be with their daughter during the, during the summertime. And so they came to that reunion. And I'd ask her, his mother said, where's George? Well, if he comes up here, my daughter doesn't go along with what's going on here. And he felt he'd cause trouble in the family, so he said he wouldn't come. Well, she goes home and called George and says, guess who's in Maine? Jack Evans. 
So here's this baptismal service going on, and they finally got them all baptized, and they're coming out, and we're singing the old, old path. And the third verse of that old, old path says, In the old, old path are my friends most dear. And about that time, his hands reached around the back and says, Jack, it's so good to see you. George Gross had flown up there just to see me. Can you see how God works in mysterious ways? And of course, I'm emotional, folks. But I took that to know that God was pleased with what these people were doing. And the day would come when I'd have to start a branch in, Mary in Florida. So sure enough, a couple of years later, we organized the branch in Mariana. And, and how I got to know the people in Mariana is another testimony. I won't take time to share it right now. But Mariana was about 70 miles west of Tallahassee. Panama City is about 50 miles south of Mariana. Troy, Alabama is where my aunt and uncle lived, and they were 90 miles north of Mariana. It was like the hub, and so we met and got together and had a retreat down there and decided to organize this branch. Now, <laughs> things really happened in mysterious ways, folks. We'd been organized like, no more than a couple of years. I get a call from a guy from Mississippi. His name was Homer McMillan. Y'all have heard me talk about Homer McMillan. That's his dad's name also. They have a different middle name, so he's not truly a junior. He says, do you have a couple of elders that come over here to, to singing River and Ocean Springs and administer to my sister? Her name was Maggie Crucifer. He says, she's in the hospital there, and the doctors are examining her and says, her colon is pitch black and is dead, and there's nothing they can do for her. And she wanted to be administered to. Well, that's 300 miles from Tallahassee. I said, we'll be there tomorrow. So I took off early the next day, and... I called Bernie up in Marianne and said, Bernie, I need you to go with me. He says, call Rad Nelson in Panama and see if he wants to go with us. Have him meet us at your house. So I jumped in my van. I take off, pick up Bernie and Rad. We go to Mississippi, the Singing River Hospital in Ocean Springs. When we get there, the families were gathered in the waiting room, and they told us only two of us could go in. And Bernie says, I'll stay out with the family and pray with them, and you all go in and administer to her. So Rad Nelson and I went in and we administered to Maggie Crucer. And we left her in the Lord's hand. Now I was reminded of the story of Jesus. Remember there was a lady that had an issue of blood for like 15 years. Now, I've got that written down here. Uh, it's in Luke, the eighth chapter, uh, about the woman that had the issue of blood. And the people were just enthroned around Christ and she worked her way through the crowd. She said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I know I'll be healed. And she did. And Jesus stopped and says, who touched me? And the disciples looked at him like, are you crazy? You're in a crowd of people. Everybody's touching you. And Jesus says, no. I felt virtue leave my body. Who touched me? And the woman knew she was taught. And she says, I did, Lord. And he says, Thy faith has made thee whole. And Lucifer, Mar uh, Maggie Crucifer, faith made her whole. In Doctrine and Covenants, the 46th section of Doctrine and Covenants, Paul mentions the, the gifts of the Spirit. But I won't read all of these, but I just want you to read this first part. Verse 5. He says, for there, 5b, For there are many gifts, and to every man is given a gift by the Spirit of God. I believe that man is like it was when God said in Genesis, I created man, male and female, I created out of them. I believe that's referred to here is that every male and female, God has given a gift. What is your gift? Spiritual gift. Do you have one? Do you know what it is? God said he's given it to everyone. You need to find out what that gift is. If you go on and read it a little further over here, it says, and again, this is in 7C, 
And again, to some it is given to have faith to be healed. And to others it is given to have faith to heal. We as members of the Mount Gadley Priesthood should seek for that gift to be to, a gift to heal. Because we have that power within us through the Mount Gadley Priesthood to lay hands upon the sick and expect them to be healed. But I'm convinced that Maggie Crucifer, because of her faith in the Lord and asked for administration, she had that faith to be healed as well. And she was. I got a call the next night after he came home, and it was Homer again. He says, Jack, I had to call and tell you the good news. You won't believe it. The doctors went in and examined my sister this morning, and they said, we don't know what happened. We've never seen this all the days of our, our, our life. We've been in, in, the, in the medicine. But when we checked your sister this morning, her colon was made up with new pink tissue healed from that death that she was facing. She sold her place, her hair and her husband moved up here to Bates City. She had a, two daughters that had already gathered up. One lived in Bates City and one lived over close to the world's of fun. But she put a double eyes out there in Bates City and she lived at least another 30 years after that. That's what God can do for us if we put our trust and faith in him. These are some of the experiences I've had. See where God is out in front. He, 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 he allowed me to know George Gross. When I needed a testimony, he sent George to me to give me that testimony of what I was going to do and needed to do was pleasing to him. Maggie Crucifer needed a blessing and, and we were there to do that. It's 300 miles too hard to go. No, no, you're called to serve. Go and do those things that God has asked us to do. As we know, James 5 says, If you're any sick among you, let them call for the elders who shall pray the prayer of faith. And the prayer of faith shall heal the sick. I've seen that happen, folks, and it'll happen to you. Well, I guess I probably should share my testimony, too. Most of you know I had cancer. In 1983, it came to an elders conference up here and same with my daughter's house. And uh, she had two bathrooms, one upstairs and one downstairs. I'd always go downstairs and leave Brenda's upstairs bathroom. But by the time I washed this big head of hair of mine and got through up there and walked back up the steps, I was out of breath. And Brenda called me laying on the bed and she came out of the bathroom and said, what's wrong with you? Nothing, I'm just a little tired. She said, yeah, you're going to the doctor when we get home. Well, to make it short, I went to the doctor. But what I want to tell you about that is what God did for us in that experience. My wife, as you know, is very studious. She's always studied. Our, our kitchen was on the back side of the house, and in front of it was the dining room. You could walk through the kitchen and go into the dining room. You go into the dining room, and we didn't eat in there. We had a kitchenette. We gave the table there. And Brendan's scriptures were laying open. And as we were going out the door to get the results of my bone marrow test to find out for sure what I had, Brendan offered us a bullet prayer and made a left turn toward the, toward the dining room and says, oh Lord, give me some hope through your word. Just a brief prayer. Give me some hope, Lord. And as she looked down at her three and one, it was open to Second Chronicles, the 20th chapter and the 15th verse, and right in the middle of this long verse, these words were underlined in black and red and bold and stood out and said, be not amazed or dismayed by this great multitude. The battle's not yours, it belongs to God. That's what the Lord told my wife when she asked for some hope in his word. She didn't say a word. She came out and got in the car because I'm an impatient person. And I'm telling her, come on, come on, I'm going to be late. So when we get to the doctor's office, he called us back into his private office. He closed the door and he says, I got some bad news for you this morning. He says, you have acute myelomonocytic leukemia. And without treatment, you'll be dead in three months. And he said, well, actually, before, he, before that, he described what it was. He says, basically what that is, is you have a, multi, a multitude of white cells. And when he said multitude of white cells, Brenda's thought went straight back to Chronicles. And that's all she heard, a multitude of white cells that's killing your red blood cells. And without treatment, you'll be dead in three months. She didn't hear that. 
He went on to say that those who respond to treatment only about 20% live past three years. That's been 19 years ago. But when we got out and got in the car, Brenda said, Jack, I think I had a spiritual experience this morning. And she told me what had happened when she asked the Lord to show her something out of the Word of God that would give her hope. And when she related that to me, the Spirit of God just filled the car. And I looked at Brenda and said, with tears in my eyes, and said, Brenda, God is telling us it's in his hands. Let's leave it there. Don't worry about it. Yes, I did take the treatment, but it was still in God's hand. You know, most people who take a 500 cc, I took six of those in concession of chemo. It had to kill all your white cells to cure you. Most people die in the hospital because they come down with something else. Without white cells, you die. That's your defense mechanism in your, of your body. But God was there protecting me and watching over and protecting me. He blesses me every day of my life. So what are God's ways? God's ways is to be with you. He prepares a way way before. He, he prepared a way for me to, to be disgruntled and leave my job at Howard Needles. He prepared a way for a man to invite me to come to Tallahassee. He prepared a way for us to organize a branch down there. He's out in front of us working ahead all the time. But you know, all this would not be, can't talk about faith without going to Moroni. And we'll close with this. Moroni, the seventh chapter. It says, How is it that ye can obtain into faith, say you shall hope? And what is it ye shall hope for? Behold, I say unto you, that ye shall have, you shall have hope through the atonement of Christ and the power of his resurrection to be raised up to eternal life. And this because of your faith in him according to the promise. Wherefore, if a man have faith, he must needs have hope. For without faith, there cannot be any hope. And again, behold, I say unto you, he, he cannot have hope, cannot have faith and hope, save he shall be meek and lowly in heart. If so, his faith and hope are vain, and none is acceptable before God, save the meek and lowly of heart. If a man be meek and lowly of heart and confesses by the power of the Holy Ghost that Jesus is the Christ, he must needs have charity. For if he have not charity, he is nothing. Wherefore, he must needs have charity. And charity suffereth long and is kind, and envieth not and is not puffed up. Seeketh not her own, but is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil, and rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. It beareth all things, it believeth all things, it hopeth all things, it endureth all things. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, if you have not charity, you are nothing, for charity never faileth. Wherefore, cleave unto charity, which is the greatest of all. For all things must fail, but charity is the pure love of Christ, and it endureth forever. And whoso is found possessed of it at the last days, it shall be well with them. Let us seek for that charity. Yes, let's have faith and hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. But let's remember that charity is the greatest of all. And, and as he said, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And if you don't know who your neighbor is, remember the story of the Good Samaritan, your enemy. Samaritans were enemies to the Jews. It's amazing to me how Jesus could really get to the Jewish people by prodding them with the, those who were enemies, saying a good Samaritan came to the rescue of a Jew. Who was neighbor to the one who fell among thieves? Let us remember what the Lord has taught us and put our trust and faith in him is my prayer. You'll open your hymnals to number 450. That'll be uh, Trust and Obey. We'll, we'll stand together and sing uh, this, uh, our closing hymn. So we lift up our voices and sing about the, uh, the blessings that come when we walk with our Lord. Um, and then I will ask our benediction uh, at the close of that hymn.
Almighty God, our kind and gracious Heavenly Father. We stand before you now as uh, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, your children. Unspeakably thankful, grateful, and in awe of your hand moving in our lives, recognizing that uh, in all things that you have prepared the way, that you have gone before us and walk with us. No matter the, uh, the situation or the time or the place, how far we are away from you. You're right there with us. Shoring us up in the moments that we needed and uh, making the way for us to move forward in your will and in your work in our lives. And in all these things we see uh, we see your great love for us. Above all, we see it in the gift of your only begotten Son. Who sacrificed all to save each one of us. And to give us this opportunity to come together. And to give our lives back again to you. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for your presence with us in this hour. For the words and the challenge that uh, that was given to us, may your desire for our lives and your love for us be written in our hearts, and may your spirit walk with us even now as we. Uh, as we close this service and return to the world around us, may we walk not in our own strength or in our own direction or according to, to our own will or desires, but yours. Bless us and watch over us as we go, I pray, and uh, be with us until we meet again. In Jesus' name. Uh, brief uh, announcement so that you know uh, we will be continuing the pictures and the updating of the, uh, uh, the board. Uh, Melody will be in the same place as she was uh, the last two Sundays um, up here in the, the, the front room uh, taking those pictures. So if you haven't done it yet uh, or if you need an updated picture, um, uh, Melody will be there to, uh, to do that for you. Thank you.